Hello, good morning. So today we're going to talk about the solar wind. Okay, but before that, let's have a brief recap of what we've learned so far. Okay, so last week we talked about the concept of transient coronal uh, activities. Specifically, we looked at two uh, parameters or events that happened occasionally in the solar corona. First one would be solar flares. So solar flares are localized explosive release of energy that travels in the speed of light in all directions. So they usually appear as sudden, short-lived brightening of the vicinity of active regions or sunspots in the chromosphere. And because the nature of these events is electromagnetic, that means this that the effect of this uh, event on Earth would take about eight minutes because it's about it takes about eight minutes for light to travel from the sun to the Earth. Solar flares are characterized based on their X-ray emissions. So specifically, we measure the X-ray flux in, in watts per square meter. Okay. Uh, if the X-ray flux is below 10 to the negative 6 watts per square meter within the range of 1 to 8 angstrom, so that's X-ray uh, that's X-ray wavelength. So that is a background type of solar flare. So that's a, a very, very low value of uh, X-ray flux. And the classes are, we are, are called A and B. C is for the you know, active flare. The range is 10 to the negative 6 to 10 to the negative 5, 10 to the negative 5. Above that, there's a major flare. That's M and M class flare. That's 10 to the negative 5 to 10 to the negative 4. And then the strongest of them more, the extreme cases, are the X class flares. That's at greater than 10 to the negative 4. So you will notice here that X-rays, X-ray fluxes are, are divided or the classification are divided in terms of orders of magnitude. Okay? So one class is actually one higher order of magnitude or one order of magnitude higher than the previous class. So not only will X flares, uh, sorry, uh, solar flares emit X-ray radi X -ray radiation. They also emit large UV radiation as well as radio waves. So this is an example of this event. This is September 6 solar flare that happened in around 12 noon, uh, 12 UT. So that's about 8 p.m. in the local time here in the Philippines. So aside from emitting large amounts of UV and X-rays, it can also it was it were it, it was it was determined that it was measured that it's also emitted what we call a say, uh, solar radio bursts or SRBs. Although just to be, just to make just to make the distinction, no, not all solar flares produce solar radio bursts, okay? So this is an example of that case where in this X-ray flux, uh, X-class flare, with a strong emissions of X-ray and UV, we're not able to produce radio waves. In this wavelength, no, this is 1,415 megahertz. But this X9.3 flare, which is the strongest flare in the solar cycle 24, Okay, we're able to produce a very large inter, uh, in very large emissions in the radio wave, specific in, in the L band. This L, this frequency is very special because this is very near to the frequency used in navigation uh, through G global navigation satellite systems. One of which would be your 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 GPS, no? So because of the solar radio burst, there were issues brought about by these emissions in the L-band. So there were performance issues that were experienced when people or people are using uh, GPS during that time. Okay, this is not affected. This has not affected us in a very direct way because this happened when the Philippines is on the night side of the earth. So this happened in the day. Uh, this can only be experienced during the day side. Uh, of the earth okay 
So, so aside from solar flares, uh, coronal mass ejections are actually are actually another example of a, another transient activity coming from the solar corona. So basically, coronal mass ejection, as the name suggests, this is ejections or um, uh, or or you know uh, ejections of solar material from the corona to the interplanetary medium. Of course, it starts with the CME eruption that happened on the surface. It can be it can be associated in different forms. It can be associated with solar flares, as I mentioned earlier. Specifically, that solar flare that I showed you produced a, a very strong a coronal mass ejection or a series of coronal mass ejection. Okay, but aside from this, it can also be produced in terms of you know eruptive filaments or prominences, which I already showed you last time. Okay. Uh, so these are some of other uh, events or phenomenon that are uh, often associated with coronal mass ejection. So as I mentioned earlier, solar flares are the most common, including eruptive uh, prominences. This is an example of an eruptive prominence or filament. Coronal dimming, Morton waves, coronal waves, and post-eruptive orchids are some of the examples as well, which, is, which was part of your uh, homework last module. Uh, best associated with uh, coronal mass ejections are best associated uh, for the whole solar cycle 23. You know, about 70% is associated with eruptive prominences or disappearing filaments if you're going to look at it in the disk of the sun. And then next would be solar flares. All the individual phenomenon of solar flares as it automatically produce coronal mass ejections. Okay, but, cor but coronal mass ejections associated with solar flares will always be will, will, will all uh, is one of the most uh, common uh, situations where CMEs are actually produced. No? Uh, so for example, if we have a coronal mass ejection produced in the uh, from an active region, so this happens when during this, uh, magnetic reconnection, so an explosion happens. So this is one of the reasons why we can actually observe flares during uh, coronal mass ejections. So this starts with a simple dipole field, okay? And then as the magnetic activity in this region increases, so the classification of this, of this active region Starts from alpha to beta to delta to gamma and then to the more complex ones. So that that indicates already that uh, the active region is very very active magnetically, which can which can be a good uh, environment for solar flares and CMEs to actually occur. Okay, so this is an example of that. Okay, uh, this an, uh, and and. Because these coronal mass ejections are very explosive, so that means they can be ejected from the sun at a very high speed. It can range from 50 kilometers per second to as high of 2,000 or even 3,000 kilometers per second. This is an example of the CMB that was produced in the September solar flare that happened, as I showed you earlier. And as you can see, the estimated linear speed uh, is about uh, 1,500 kilometers per second, which was also part of your quiz the other day, okay? Uh, but aside from this, uh, we can actually observe, uh, but from, uh, anyway, from the information of, for example, for this information where you can actually observe a coronal mass ejection with the speed of about 1,400 that happened in December 7, 2020, okay? Because we already know the speed, uh, more or less we know where, when it will arrive at the Earth's orbit. But aside from that, we also have to know how this, this, uh, this plasma cloud, so to speak, would behave in the interplanetary space. And in order to do that, we have to know a little bit more about the solar wind. So that's why we're going, that's what we're going to talk about today. Okay. Questions 
Questions, please. Okay, sige. Okay, now, moving on. So, as I mentioned earlier, I will go into look into the solar wind today. Okay, so a very free call of the solar corona. So, solar corona are can be observed using several things. We can actually observe using uh, during solar eclipses. We can observe it in the extreme UV or even X-ray uh, view of the sun. And we can also use coronagraphs to observe the solar corona. So this is an example of a, of a uh, solar eclipse that happened in July 11, 20, uh, 2010. And then uh, this paper, okay, Rusin et al, 2010, was able to predict these features of the sun wherein it verified or it showed that uh, this corona image can actually be used to have an idea or to map out the magnetic configuration or the magnetic field lines of your sun, at least in this view. No? Okay, so you will notice here that there are several components. They have your radial components, and then you have your dipole component, and you have your neutral sheets. Okay, so these open field lines, as you will notice, are emanating from all sides uh, for, or from in all directions from the sun. Okay, so these open field lines are actually connected to the interplanetary space or the magnetic field in the interplanetary space. It can actually form, it is more open in the in the regions emanating from the corona holes. But even in helmet streamers, those are, uh, this uh, magnetic field lines can also be open, no? Okay. Uh, this is where, this open field line is where your charged particle from the surface of the sun can freely escape into space. Because remember from our previous discussion using your frozen in, uh, field theorem that plasma can be trapped within uh, magnetic flux tubes. So these open magnetic flux tubes can also can 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 serve as a, a a pipe, so to speak, or a tunnel where your plasma material can flow through. Uh, also, this is also consistent to our discussion in our uh, when we talked about behavior of charged particle in electric magnetic field when we were able to show there that single charged particles can, are actually moving along the direction of the magnetic field lines. They can be trapped, they, they gyrate, and they can even drift. Okay, but they, they always follow the direction of the magnetic field line. Okay, and this is what we call your solar wind. And because of the fact that uh, the solar wind is a wind, so therefore, is actually an expansion of the solar corona to very large heliocentric distances. Okay, so, and this is brought about by the differences in pressure, okay, plasma pressure between the surface of the sun to the interplanetary space. Because the interplanetary space is actually considered to be a very low pressure area. So that means the parameters or the, the, the particles that are residing or charged particles in the sun is actually sucked up. It, is, it acts like a vacuum cleaner sucking the plasma material from the sun towards the space. Okay, uh, this plasma that I'm talking about is actually a mixture of several things. It can it it is a, it is a mixture of protons, or positively ions, you know, the heavier ions, or even electrons. So that's why when we talked about solar wind, when we, we measure solar wind, we can observe the proton density and even electron density. And even, of course, if this is a plasma, therefore we can actually express the plasma, express plasma in terms of its plasma temperature. The density, as I mentioned earlier, is very important when we, when we measure solar wind because if we know the background solar wind, <clears throat> therefore we know whether a, a, an anomaly happens okay uh, on certain occasions uh, density by the way 
varies inversely with near spheric distances. Okay, so that means as you go further, the density of the solar wind uh, decreases because because of the fact that you know because the direction is is radial. So that means as you go further, this density material uh, uh, is distributed in a in a larger volume than before. Okay, so these particles that radially flow outward from the sun carry its own magnetic field. Okay, as if that plasma is frozen in. So that's why it's very important to know or understand at the very least uh, the basics of frozen in theory. Because uh, whatever the direction of the magnetic field of the interplanetary magnetic field, that is where plasma will flow. Okay, so this serves as a, because this is this magnetic field serves as a guide where this wind flows. Okay, so typical values of uh, of the of solar wind at the Earth's orbit. So we we usually measure solar wind parameters at the Earth's orbit, and we mainly use two satellites: the Advanced Composition Explorer or ACE. And the uh, Deep Space Climate Observatory. The, this is a newer one. Oh. But uh, Discover Satellite is actually a follow-on mission to the ACE. But right now, ACE is actually performing well still. No? Uh, but the Discover Satellite actually provides a complement data set for the Advanced, space, uh, advanced Composition Explorer. Where as these two uh, satellites uh, are parked, they are actually parked in one of the Lagrange points. Okay, so we say Lagrange points. So this is, these are points around this orbit. So L1, L2, L3, L4, L5, where the gravitational forces between the sun and the earth and the centrifugal force between each other balances out. So that even if the earth rotates about the sun, this points, if you are, if you place a particle or if you place an object here, it will remain there, even if the sun rotates now, just like this animation. Okay, so that, what, how important is that? So if these two, two satellites are parked at the L1 point, that means 24-7, these two satellites always observes the sun. Okay, in fact, Two satellites are also orbit in the L5 and L4, where uh, those uh, satellites are called the SOHO satellites. So SOHO are your are the ones that produce the coronagraphs. But aside from that, there also provides a side view, so that if, for example, one SOHO, oh, sorry, not SOHO, uh, Stereo, sorry, Stereo. That's why it's called Stereo. It's, it's pairs. So if the one of the satellite, if the satellite is located at L5. So that means it can see the sun's activity in the night side, in the in the at the side. Sorry, so a part of it will will see the night side of the sun, a part of it will see the day side. So we know night uh, the at the side view that if something happens from the sun, we can actually see you know what in this in this view you know what would be the direction of that certain uh, that event. But anyway. Uh, these two satellites, so this is an example of that, of the parameters, no? typical parameters that we can actually observe. This is uh, observed from uh, October 10, Sunday, UT, 10 UT until October 11, uh, yesterday, 10 UT. Okay, so you will notice here that the magnetic field that carried, that carries, that is carried by the solar wind or the interplanetary magnetic field ranges from about 5 to 10 nanotesla. So more or less, this is the average or the typical range of values of magnetic field of the solar wind. Density would vary from about uh, around 5 to 50 uh, per cubic cm. And then speed would range about 300 to 400. That's the average solar wind. But uh, if there is a transient solar wind, for example, if a coronal mass ejection happened in the sun, uh, we can actually see that this solar wind 
is accelerated by the uh, by the coronal mass ejection or even if there is a corona hole so corona hole are actually windows where in fast moving solar wind can actually emanate from and it will be all with it will also be a, a reflected in the speed okay and this is the temperature so the temperature is about uh 1000 uh, 10000 to about uh yeah, 10,000 to about uh, 100,000 okay. uh, degrees Kelvin. So just to give an idea how the solar wind varies as a function of latitude. So one mission that was, that was, uh, that was, that was done before using what we call this Ulysses uh, spacecraft, they, it, it, was, it was able to orbit the side of the sun, the uh, this orbit of the sun, polar orbit of the sun, and it measured the uh, solar wind and the direction of the interplanetary magnetic field. Okay, so this is an example of that. So you can notice here that uh, around the corona holes, you will notice here that you have corona holes. The corona holes is actually a source of a, a very strong solar wind. It's about uh, around 700 kilometers per second at the at the polar regions where your you know polar winds from corona holes are actually coming from. But on the equatorial side, we can see that it's about you know typical 500 to 400 kilometers per second. Okay, so this is our typical solar wind that can be measured at the orbit of the Earth because this is where this plane. Is where your is where Earth is uh, is, but if you measure if you have a satellite above polar caps or polar regions of the Sun where coronals are usually found, you can actually measure very large solar wind. Okay, but this is during solar minimum. You can actually see also that the upper part the, the interplanetary magnetic field is outward, and then below the interplanetary magnetic field is downward. So you can see it as the magnetic field lines coming out from the top and actually close from the bottom, okay? But it's a very large dipole. But if you have a very active magnetic field or if you have a very active sun, you can see that uh, fewer corona holes are and smaller, cor fewer or smaller corona holes can be observed. As you notice from your assignments, and you can see that because of that, the magnetic field and even the solar the solar wind velocity is actually reduced to about you know about four hundred to three hundred on the average during solar maximum. Okay, and then you can also notice that the direction of the IMF is actually more complicated. Okay, so it's uh, that's why it's very important to really monitor the solar activity by just looking at the sunspots. Okay, so that's it. No? This is the polar plots of solar wind as a function of latitude as measured by the Ulysses spacecraft. Now, how do we, uh, at the very least for at the start now, how, how solar wind or the interplanetary magnetic field actually behaves in the ecliptic plane or equatorial plane? So we use the Parker model, uh, gender, um, that is uh, formulated by Eugene Parker in, 19, in 1958. This guy is actually alive right now. And we have a spacecraft called the Solar Parker Probe that is named after him. So this is a spacecraft that, that's the first, uh, that, uh, that's one of the first spacecrafts that have a mission to observe the sun at very close distances. No? So it's a very revolution, revolutionary um, technology that we have right now. Okay, now uh, in 1958, as I mentioned earlier, Eugene Parker predicted the existence of a continuous solar wind flow, assuming that the particles flowed radially outward of the sun and the particles are actually frozen in in the solar magnetic field. Okay, so uh, so this outward acceleration. Uh, of the solar wind is mainly caused by, as I mentioned earlier, you, the, the, the pressure difference between uh, 
the pressure at the surface of the sun and the pressure in the interplanetary space. Okay? So, uh, the magnetic field or the interplanetary magnetic field model in two dimension is actually given by this equation. So, it has a radial and a polar component where these are your parameters. R is the radial distance from the center of the sun. Theta is the polar angle in radians. We have the, uh, the frequency of solar rotation. It's about 27 days no? at the equator. And then, it, uh, sorry, it's about 30 days at the equator. V is the solar wind speed. That's why it's very important to calculate the solar wind speed or measure the solar, solar wind speed. And you can actually use the magnetic field strength at the solar surface. So using this equation, you can actually map out the magnetic field of the interplanetary magnetic field. Okay, And these are some of the typical values now at the surface of the Earth. So the magnetic field lines for this magnetic field by just getting the dot product between D, L, and B, we can obtain an equation like this. This is actually an Archimedean spiral. Okay, so if we go into plot or map out the Archimedean spiral, it looks like a water sprinkler that is rotating. Okay, if you could imagine that, if you have a sprinkler at your lawn, for example, and then a uh, water is sprayed in all directions and then the sprinkler is rotating. You can, you can actually see this no, no, anywhere. You can see that the, the flow of your water is actually spiraling like this. Okay. So for example, for one parcel, okay, for one parcel that, uh, that is emitted here as this, this par, uh, at this uh, location where it continuously uh, emits particles. Okay, while this particle is being ejected radially outward, the sun at the same time rotates. Okay, so this is the result of that particle motion. No? So this is particle seven, particle six, five, four, three, two, one. So this particle is the first one that was uh, uh, emitted at this point, but as this as the sun rotates in this direction, okay, continuously this particle, this location emits particle. So if we're going to map out that path, it would look something like this. So this is where your particle will actually flow through. Okay. So if we have in all direction, it would look something like this. Okay, so we call this your Archimedean spiral. By the way, this is your ecliptic view or your equatorial view. So this is your orbit of the Earth. Now, uh, as mentioned in one of our first classes, our first, uh, first discussion, the, we can actually model the solar magnetic field okay, in terms of radial, dipole, and neutral sheets geometry. This is an example of your current sheet source surface model for coronal magnetic field from this paper. So one very important thing that we should look at here is that at the equatorial side or some of, some of the sides, for example, or some of the, in some directions, especially in helmet, 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 uh, helmet streamers, you can actually observe what we call neutral sheets. And that's the, that's the boundary between magnetic field lines that are going in one direction and in the other direction. So this red line corresponds to the red line here. So this is your magnetic field that is pointing outward of the sun. And then the blue line are the magnetic field coming into the sun. Okay. So the neutral sheet, sometimes we call this the current sheets, is actually found at that boundary. Okay, so this current sheet is actually a boundary between two magnet two regions of magnetic field in opposite directions. So these the spacecraft from the Ulysses Ulysses spacecraft were able to measure that as well or observe that as well. So this example of that Helmert streamer, this one, and as you can see here, that uh, this is actually a boundary between magnetic field that is pointing outward and the magnetic field that is pointing inward. And this is usually found in the current sheets in 
And this is basically found in the equatorial region during solar minimum, but during solar maximum, they can be found anywhere. Okay, so that's why it's very important to really look at the solar wind parameters. Anyway, so going back to this image, so this image is the ecliptic view of this magnetic field that is going outward or inward. No? It can be inward, it can be outward. Okay, now if you're going to look at this in three dimensions, it would actually look at like this. No? So we call this your ballerina skirt shape. Uh, this is what we call the heliospheric current sheets. So this sheet is actually in this form. So as the material, as the sun rotates around it, it will form that Archimedean, it Archimedean, ano, no? Archimedean uh, uh, spiral. But in three dimension, it will act as a uh, a ballerina skirt. Okay. So this is an example of that as well. So that means uh, if the, for example, in this case, so if this is the Earth, if this is the Earth, uh, you will notice here that the Earth is actually below the ballerina skirts. So that means this is in opposite direction of the solar wind and the interplanetary magnetic field uh, compared to the side above the skirt. Okay. So, for example, here, if, uh, if the direction above the solar, uh, above this current sheet is uh, away from the sun, that means Mar, this, this, sorry, this should be, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. So, this is Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. This is Jupiter. So, this is Jupiter. So Jupiter is under the skirt. Uh, Mars is under the skirt. But Earth, Venus, and Mercury is above the skirt. So if we're going to look at the inter direction of the interplanetary magnetic field in general, it, the magnetic field is actually pointing uh, up, uh, away, let's say, from, uh, away from the sun toward the Earth. But the magnetic field experiences by the by Mercury and Jupiter, uh, by Mars and Jupiter, is actually the magnetic field going in. Okay, so I hope you, you understand this now. So if you have a very complex solar wind, it would look something like this. So that means the direction of the magnetic field is the or the 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 speed emanating from all sides of the sun is not is not it's not as uniform as this. So what happens? So that means there are regions where uh, there are regions where magnetic field is going away. There are magnetic field that's going toward, and there are corona loops. There are areas where there are uh, uh, sources of fast fast moving wind. There are sources of slow moving wind. So what's the effect? As the what's the effect to that? What we call that spiral, no? So as the sun rotates in this direction, okay, and then you have slow, fast, and slow. So there will be some compression areas or regions where in this slow moving solar wind actually comp and then uh, and then uh, compresses this stream of particles coming from a fast solar wind uh, uh, stream flow. And then this is your slow moving solar wind. So because this is this is fast, this is slow. So this is actually, so imagine you have slow moving cars on the front and then you are very fast and then you are very slow at the back. So what does it, ha what happens is that the slow moving cars here will actually make, uh, will actually compress the, material or the cars at the behind them okay so i hope you can you can you can i know that you can you can imagine that and that is uh, why we can actually observe models like this okay so this what we, this is an example of a two-dimensional solar wind model model so this is in the ecliptic plane 
This is the Earth's orbit. This green dot is the Earth's position. This is in the north-south direction. This is in the latitudinal uh, uh, plane. Okay, so this is north and this is south. So you will notice here for the plasma density, okay, there are increased plasma density here. There's also plasma density here that are very, very large. This one. So particularly this one, this very large uh, mod, uh, the region where there's large plasma density. This actually coincides with this part now, this part. In this part, on this, uh, below this, we have your radial velocity. So blue pertains to slow. Green is relatively faster. So you will notice here that this is a slow moving wind. This part is a slow moving wind. And then this part is your fast moving wind. So relative to these two sides, this is a very fast solar, solar wind. Okay. So that's why. So this is a slow. This is fast and this is slow. Just like this one, this is slow. This is fast. This is slow. So that means this slow actually is the one that compresses the plasma here, which is depicted by this region. If you're going to play this, that actually makes sense. Okay. Okay, so this is an example of that. Uh, ambient solar wind. No? This was measured in 20, 2021, last uh, Saturday, 10 UT. Okay, so this is the run. Okay, so this is your ambient solar wind. Now, what happens if we have a transient event in the solar corona? Okay, so this happened, so last October 9, a few, a few days ago, there was an M-class flare. This is M1.6 flare that happened in, uh, if you're going to look at here, okay. Okay, so at about 6.45 UT here. This is an M1.6, one of the few M-class flares that happened this year. And it came from this very simple looking active region. Okay, and then from this, Player, a coronal mass ejection happened. So if you can notice here, there is a very faint halo CME okay, that happened at around just after this flare happened. Now, what is its effect? What is its effect to the solar wind? Okay, so again, this is still in October 9. Using the WSA and LIL model uh, provided by the Space Weather Prediction Center of NOAA, okay, this is what happened. So the first, few, the first few frames here are the ones that I showed you. That's your ambient solar wind. So you still remember this now, no? this, this part. No? Okay, so if you're going to see here at 6, uh, at, at October 9, sorry, at October 9, at around 6 UT, you can see that right after that, there is now, if you can see a very faint uh, anomaly at, at those sides, so you can see it here. So what happens is that, so we can actually see here the model. So they, they modeled how that CME, okay, uh, within the solar wind. And they predicted that at around, at around uh, 11 UT, October 11, yesterday. So 11 UT is about 7 PM, okay. This cloud, came from this CME originated from that active region will arrive at this time, okay? So this is a mixture of how solar wind actually interacts with your transient coronal mass ejections. Okay, that's why it's also important to really estimate 
the speed of your coronal mass ejections, which is also part of your exam the other day. Okay? Now, that's why when they made this, when they made, uh, when the Solar with, Sol, uh, Space Weather Prediction Center uh, made this model, they sound uh, a geomagnetic storm watch. Okay, so this watch, this geomagnetic storm watch was issued in uh, for October 11, and it expected that this is an this is an updated model, by the way. And this is an updated model. Uh, so this is uh, it is it is expected that the CME will arrive on Earth, here on Earth, at 12 UT around 8 p.m. Philippine Standard Time. And what is a G2 uh, geomagnetic storm? So these are some of the primary area of impact. So poleward from 55 degrees north of geomagnetic latitude going up. This is where we are safe relatively. No? Some possible effects. So for power systems, you will have power grip fluctuations. Some, some, may, some may experience voltage alarm at high latitudes. Uh, so for, for spacecraft, we can have some orientation irregularities. You can actually observe uh, increased drag. So when what happens if there's an increased drag for lower Earth orbits, orbiters or low Earth orbit satellites, one, one, one possible consequence is it may reduce, okay? It may reduce uh, satellite lifetime mission, okay? And then for radio, so for high latitude, a high frequency propagation, uh, yung mga ham radio, they will have some issues there. Uh, and of course, yung the, the, the more popular effect of geomagnetic storm would be your aurora. Okay, so let's see uh, if we could check whether this forecast is successful. Okay, so let me stop sharing my screen. Okay, so let me just, okay, so this is the real-time solar wind coming from, yeah, coming from Discover Satellite. The red line is your Enlil prediction. So this is your magnetic field. Red is the Z component of the magnetic field, which will be very important for our next topic, which is on geomagnetism. Black line is for your geomagnetic field. So you will notice here, okay. Okay, so again, let me just, okay, so this is your full screen. Okay, now let's, let's, let's look at this figure now. So the solid line is your Enlil, uh, Enlil uh, updated and uh, WSA Enlil um, prediction. The, the dotted lines or the dots are the actual magnetic field, uh, actual measurements. So this is solar wind temperature, solar wind speed, solar wind density. Uh, phi tells you if it is toward the earth or away from the earth. What's what more important is magnetic field. So this is your ambient magnetic field. This is your Z magnetic field. So you notice here at this moment, at this moment, you can see that uh, there's a sudden jump in density, in speed, in even in temperature, even in magnetic field. So that means this mesh, this the 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 plasma that is being measured by this satellite, by the Discover satellite, is not the ambient solar wind. So this is the CME that we are actually uh, waiting for. And it, it, it arrived uh, 12 hours late or 13 hours late from the, from the earlier prediction. All right, so you can see that while this model very, is, is a very good uh, indicator of more or less when, but it's not as accurate as we want it to be. Okay, but there are already efforts of improving this kinds of model. But the point is that it did arrive. So this, this plasma measurement at the Earth's orbit is actually the CME that arrived. 
Now, if the CME arrive at the Earth's orbit, we already we will call that an ICME or interplanetary coronal mass ejection. So, if we're going to to want to read on this, sometimes we will call this ICME or interplanetary coronal mass ejection. Okay. So, what does it that does it mean? This figure says that at this moment. Uh, at around at around two UT, two UT is about ten PM. Or no, this is nine forty eight PM at nine forty eight AM today. Uh, that CME arrived, so we can actually observe that by, I don't know, by using various uh documents. Uh, one of the consequence of this if you're going to go to home for this website is that we can now actually see a geomagnetic storm so this this red line is um, it's a geomagnetic index where it describes how disturbed the earth's magnetic field is okay so when this parameter, we call this the planetary K index or KP index. If it goes beyond 4, 4.5, 4.3, 4.65, etc., we are already experiencing geomagnetic storm, which is brought about by that arrival of the CME. Okay? So that's it. So that's your... So indeed, no? Indeed the... Uh, indeed the... CME arrived, but it's a bit late. It's a bit, it's almost, uh, it's almost twelve hours late now. But nevertheless, it's it it it, it still arrived. It's, there are a lot of things that are happening between the suns, between the sun and the region between the sun and the earth. It's a very, it's a very far, it's a very long journey, no, from the sun to the earth. So that's why. It's very important to 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 really observe these things. Now, now going back to um, to our solar flare that I showed you earlier, that September flare, um, there are two uh, there are two CMEs that happen. So one, there is an M class flare that happened at around twenty UT. Okay, on September 4, twenty seventeen. Okay, so. Uh, when the when space weather prediction center made that uh, made this model you can see that uh, that that cme oh sorry you can see that the cme that was seen here will more or less arrive at 916 but only one cme but two days later Okay, two days later, at around 12 UT, there was that X-class flare that happened. And it produced a very large CME. So, aside from that September 4 CME, the model was updated to include the second CME. So, this is the first CME. And this is the second CME. Okay, you can see that. Okay, let's review that. So this is the first CME that 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 caused that is caused by this flare, and this is the second CME, and you will see that they produce two uh, two arrivals. No? this is the first arrival of the first CME, and this is the second arrival of the second CME. So if we're going to look at the solar wind data, we can actually observe that two CME. So this is the first CME that arrived at October seven, at arrived at September seven. More or less, it's the same no, on the spot, no. But the second CME actually arrived at at the start of September eight. But the model prediction predicted that it will arrive a little bit later, at around twelve UT. But it did arrive. So this is the first CME and this is the second CME. Of course, there's a third CME uh, 
but it's not included in this model anymore. Okay. So, so yeah. So that's it. So that's uh and so that's the, that's an example of that how important solar wind and modeling the solar wind is. And it all um it all stems from the first model provided by Eugene Parker in 1958, wherein he estimated or he modeled the solar wind to be moving in a Archimedean spiral. And that's one of the that's the basis of this models and we were able to that's why we were able to predict you know, up to a certain level of um, up to a certain level of accuracy you know, when coronal mass ejections for example will arrive on earth so that we could have some uh, idea what to expect and what to do to mitigate any if any uh, if there are any um, possible consequences that we will arrive. And one of the possible consequences is due to the geomagneti geomagnetism effects of this uh, uh, transcend solar corona events. And that will, that will be our next topic for, for, the, for the coming weeks. Okay? So that's it. That's our class for today. Thank you for your time. And I will see you next time, okay?